Thanks, Royce. Uh, I could have given you a whole bunch more nice stuff to say if you wanted to keep going there, but uh, I, I appreciate the invitation. You know, Kevin told me that uh, you guys are a uh, praying, welcome, welcoming church, friendly church. And I would really say that I, that's what I saw this morning. You know, the, the pressure was on. You know, he said that, so I was going to be watching for that. And I've really seen that this morning. And uh, I think you guys call it the First Impressions team. Is that correct? Fantastic job, guys. I know what it's like to to walk down a sidewalk to a church for the first time and feel like you're attacked. Oh, no, you know, not that much. And I also know what it's like to feel like you're ignored. Hey, I'm here, you know. And uh, you guys really uh, uh, did a great job staying within the parameters of those two extremes. And so I appreciate your doing so and doing that. And we do have some visitors uh, this morning. I met four guys from Lackland. Really appreciate you guys being there. And I asked them what they had in common and they pointed to the guy with the car and so uh, uh, thanks for having a car and uh, uh, appreciate God using that uh, for all of us today but really is is good to be with you we appreciated Kevin when he worked with us in collegiate ministry at UTSA and uh, when uh, Dr. Rick Spencer and I interviewed him years ago eight or nine years ago uh, I was impressed that Kevin's sense of call was to make disciples. It wasn't to preach. It wasn't to be famous. It wasn't to, uh, to lead his church. It was to make disciples. And it's actually, that's what he had done in his previous uh, position among an, a number of college students. He had discipled them and they were making an impact on the campus where they were attending at SAC. And uh, that's how we heard about Kevin. And that's why we were uh, interested. That's why we recruited him. We recruited him away from a church so that he would go and make disciples at UTSA campus for us. And he did so faithfully, and we really appreciate his work. And now a good friend of mine, Izzy Mendez, Israel, is there and uh, building on the foundation that Kevin's laid. But I appreciate that. My assignment today from Kevin is to uh, talk about evangelism and discipleship. And I know evangelism, you're going, yeah, that's for the professionals, the guys, and some of whom are really actually overbearing. And those are the guys that I don't like, and it's the guys that I don't want to be associated with. But hopefully I can paint a little bit different picture of that for you today. And then discipleship. What disciple means is to, uh, to be a committed follower, an, understand, an understudy. To, to be mentored. And so we're going to talk about those two things and put them together. And I, that's actually the theme that is my job with uh, college students around the state of Texas. Is uh, My job is to keep evangelism and discipleship the priority of Texas BSM. And so uh, it's fun that I would be able to, to do part of what I do every day with you today as well. So, uh, glad, glad to be here with you. We, uh, we do have a PowerPoint presentation, and uh, uh, the guys in the booth would be trying to keep up with me. I asked them to read my mind, and uh, uh, my wife says that uh, after 33 years, I don't do a very good job of reading hers, but uh, mine is a whole lot easier to read than my wife's mind. So I think you guys will be able to keep up with me and uh, know where we're going there. But today I'm going to uh, talk about, uh, first of all, going to highlight my favorite four verses about discipleship and, and evangelism. And I think that most of you will be very familiar with each of them. And so I'm not going to go and look at them under a microscope and uh, ex exegete them. I started to say execute them. I may do that. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're not going to exegete these four verses. Uh, like I said, I think they're already familiar with you. But we're going to put them all together, see them all in the same context. And then I'm just going to share a couple of stories with you. And the purpose of my stories are, frankly, I'm in both of them. But they're not stories about me. I hope what you hear is stories about a sovereign God who pursues those who do not yet know him. And the trouble he goes to and the people he involves, some of that's kind of surprising sometimes. And so I really hope what you hear is a story about the initiative 
of a sovereign God. And uh, I'm both the benefactor of his initiative and I'm also a co-participant with him in that same initiative. So that's what I hope you hear. Let's look at these four verses. And we'll put one of them on the screen in time. Matthew 28, 19, 20. This is called the Great Commission. Commission. Yeah. And uh, it, it's not the Great Attraction. <laughs> it's the Great Commission. And uh, it's actually the words of Jesus. And it was the very first time, chronologically in scriptures, when Jesus handed over the baton to the 11 men who had actually been on a three-year camp out with him. And he said, guys, your deal. And he handed them the baton. And he did it in these, these words. Uh, some of the translations we've read and memorized uh, sound like this. Go therefore and make disciples, right? And maybe a more accurate translation of that commission would be as you're going, make disciples. And it's the as you're going part that I would like, hopefully, to give you a picture of today that you can see yourselves as a participant. You know, those were 11 men, and uh, they had one thing in common. They were all amateurs. There wasn't a professional Christian in a bunch. There wasn't a preacher. None had ever been to seminary. And in fact, the, there were a whole bunch of professional religious people in the day and uh, you know Jesus didn't pick a single one of those guys when he picked 12 to go and share life with him he picked all amateurs and then when it came to the end of the time that he had with them he handed the baton to amateurs and he asked them he said as you're going now guys your turn make disciples and then you know you know the rest of it you know baptizing and teaching and preaching and then at the end of it he said made this this amazing promise king james says and lo and sometimes those times are low but and lo i am with you always i'll be i'll be with you every step of the way i'm handing you the baton and then we're going to go together we're going to do this together we're going to be partners Acts 1.8 is the next passage of Scripture. It talks about that partnership even further. And uh, these were the same men come back together. There were, you know, the, the 11 of them, they would actually added another. And there may have been some other people who joined them in this conversation. And this is the other version of the Great Commission that Luke gives us in Acts 1.8. It says, uh, he, he really just made a promise and a prediction. And he said this, You will be my witnesses. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking these guys, when he said, go there for, or as you're going, make disciples, they're going. You, you talking about us? You know, the ones that like, three weeks ago, we all wimped out. And when the going got tough, we all flushed. Are, are you sure you're talking about us? And then in Acts 1-8, the way Luke uh, uh, records it, you know, this promise and this prophecy. You, yeah, you guys, the amateurs, you will be my witnesses. And then he really made, I mean, the promise was a big one. In Judea, Samaria, in, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, utter no, uttermost parts of the world. And they're going, you talking about us? I think that's what they, I, I, if I were there, I would have been going, who are you talking to? Talking about us? Let's go to the next one. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. This is uh, one that you may not associate necessarily with the Great Commission or with uh, evangelism, discipleship. And it was Paul talking to his understudy who is also uh, an amateur. And Paul, we could go into some detail about his story. Many of you know his story. He was actually a terrorist who had an encounter with God that he could not ignore. And he made a 180 degree turn in every area of his life and was appointed by God to be the apostle, this one sent to the Gentiles. And that'd be everybody in this room, me, all of us. And so Paul had followed the example and the philosophy of ministry that he had heard about and even seen some of 
that Jesus did. And what was Jesus' strategy? What was his philosophy of ministry? Spent a lot of time with a few guys and really impact their lives. So that they would spend a whole lot of time with a few guys and really impact their lives. And that they would do the same. And then we would invoke a multiplication means of reaching the world instead of just addition. 2 Timothy 2.2 says that. Even the numbers suggest what's going on here. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. It's Paul saying this, The things that you, Timothy, have heard of me among many witnesses, commit to a few, commit to faithful men, who then will be able to teach others also. And so there were four generations of believers in that one verse right there. And, uh, you know, appreciate you guys uh, uh, getting the board and all my props and stuff in order. And uh, I feel like I was in a lot of trouble. But uh, just think about it. Here's Paul talking to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. It's Paul. He had already invested a lot of his life and time into Timothy. <laughs> And then he was telling Timothy, do the same thing. Hey, and the other thing Jesus did, spend a lot of time with a few. Yeah, well, that's what I've done with you. And you do it with others. Timothy, uh, faithful men, he calls them. And then others also. And uh, actually, the only reason you and I are in the room is because people did that faithfully. You know, churches that gathered and had buildings and paid preachers and seminaries and all that kind of stuff, that came well into the Christian movement. And in fact, the whole book of Acts, you know, about the, the growth of the, the explosion of the church in the first century, they didn't have any professional preachers, they didn't have any seminaries, they didn't have any buildings, they didn't have, they didn't have any budgets. And it was people who met in small groups who spent a lot of time with each other. And they impacted the lives of those that they were closest to. And they did exactly what Paul said right there in 2 Timothy. The things you've heard of me among many witnesses commit to faithful men and teach others also. Uh, I hope you're catching my drift. What, what I'm talking about, what I'm hoping to share with you, is a, a means of being church and of reaching the world that could be done without this building. It could be done without Kevin. It could be done without our semin seminaries. And uh, because it, it's always and only done by people. And I think the people who, are that, who, are, who God uses most powerfully are often the amateurs. And so, certainly I'm thankful for the professionals. You know, they've made an impact in my life and I'll continue to listen to them. But it's the amateurs. Is because of the amateurs that I'm in this room with you today. And uh, how, how many of you would consider yourself a professional, paid, like, Christian worker? Anybody? Okay, good. I'm in a room full of amateurs. I mean, I'm keeping good company this morning. That's, that's what we're talking about. Acts 17, 24. And this one may not be as familiar with you. Uh, this is actually a story out of the life of Paul. He was on missionary trips and things had not gone the way they had planned. And even in mission trips, it happens that way. You know, uh, vacations, it happens that way, doesn't it? But things hadn't gone the way that he had planned. And he actually ended up in a place called Athens that he hadn't planned to go to at all. He had a plan, but that wasn't the plan. And he ended up being sent there. Lots of drama had taken place that led, led to this. But here's what Paul did when he landed in Athens, a place he'd never planned to be on, and a place actually he didn't even want to be. Well, there were some guys who met down at the town square. And they had a little bit, a little philosophy club going on there. And I frankly don't relate to that personally. You know, I've, you know, I've been part of some clubs, but the, the philosophy club wouldn't attract me. But that was what Paul had in common with some of these people in this place where he'd never been before. And so he, every day it says, made it his business to go down and join these guys on the town square 
where they sat around and talked about philosophy. Now, Athens was a place where philosophy had been talked about before. It was where Socrates had been. It's where Plato had been. And so this was kind of a, you know, kind of the end thing there. I guess kind of like Austin or something. And uh, so this is what people did there. They, that was kind of the cool thing to do. Be a philosophy guy. Hey, Paul, I just now saw you. I'm sorry to point you out. Um, but anyway, here, here's the philosophy club. They meet down the town square. And so Paul, the Bible Paul, uh, makes it his business to go and get to know these guys every day. He joins the club, joins in on the club. And finally one day they said, what about you? What do you have to say for yourself? And then Paul answered with this verse that I'm going to share with you. Acts 17, 26. He said this. From one man, he made every nation of men. He determined the time set for them and the exact... Oh, I left out something. From one man, he made every nation of men that they would inhabit the whole earth. He determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live, time and place, in order that all men may seek Him and perhaps reach out for Him and find Him. Paul talked about the sovereignty of God in his pursuit of all people. And I know that Calvinism, you know, is kind of, we have, we're kind of in a neo-Calvinism thing in the world right now. And, you know, the Calvinists are the ones that are the, the uh, kind of the mega-sovereignists and really have a high view of the sovereignty of God. <laughs> Me too. Uh, but there's one tenet about Calvinism that I just can't go with, and that's that some are elect and some are not. Because, frankly, the most... The most uh, prolific metaphor for God in the Bible is Father. And as a father, I can't imagine having a son and not choosing him. But anyway, that, that I'm not going to get off into the debate. But from this verse right here, Paul seems to indicate that God's kind of after everybody. And I'm sure glad he was after me. I'm glad that I wasn't on the list of the non-elect. And I'm, I don't want my kids on that list. But Paul says... That God has, he's gone to a whole lot of trouble to direct your steps and mine. And, and when you determine somebody's time and place, you're sovereign. He says, God has so engineered our lives and planned our lives. And it may seem like there's this random stuff going on and, and ended up in all kinds of places. And, and then you end up crossing paths with a specific individual because God's in hot pursuit of everybody. And amazingly, he picks the amateurs, people just like us, to be the actors on reaching those people who are real important to him, and he's really after them. Another verse that's not in the outline, so you guys uh, won't find it there. It's Isaiah 65, 1. It talks about the pursuit of God. And just let this verse soak in a little bit. Um, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. That verse tells me that God's in hot pursuit of everybody. Okay, let's think about everybody for a minute. Some of you guys are from families who have crazy people in them. <laughs> I think all families have crazy people in them. <laughs> you know, pick the craziest. God's in hot pursuit. That crazy person. Some of you guys work at places where there's lots of drama. Do you? Or you want to say so here, you know, where it may get out. But some of you work with crazy people. And even the craziest, according to my understanding of the pursuit of God, and who he's after in light of Acts 17, 26. The craziest person you work for. God's crazy in love about him. And wants him. He would want to pursue him. Some of you kids go to school with uh, classmates who are foul-mouthed and profane. And the stories they tell is cute, should never be told in mixed company, right? 
the foulest of them all goes in high pursuit. And what, what is the likelihood about that crazy person in your family, that crazy person that you work with, the foul-mouthed kid at school, what is the likelihood of them waking up this morning and saying, you know what, I think I'll go to church today. <laughs> now, that's, that would be a stretch, wouldn't it? It would be a stretch. But what if God says, man, I love that crazy man. <laughs> and uh, you know what? I have a friend who knows him. And so I'm going to set, start setting up things right now so that they get close to each other. And guess what? So you and me are picked by God to go be friends with crazy people. Yeah, we really are. Picked by God to do that. Let's think about the, uh, the people who are in our circle. I'm, gonna draw, I'm actually going to draw a circle. There's a Greek word called oikos. And it means tribe. It means group. It means the Facebook word. It's your peeps. <laughs> That's your oikos. I'll go ahead and write that word down. O-I-K-O-S. Oikos. And each of us has one. You know, you may not have much, but everybody got an oikos. <laughs> and all of, all of us have a group of people. And when we look around, there's the people we're sharing life with. We're walk, walking on this planet with them. And uh, among that group of people, uh, let's just, let's, this is arbitrary, I know. Let's say half of them are believers. And uh, if we're not really, uh, if we're not really careful, we end up only hanging around believers. And even the crazy people we work with, we'll just keep our distance from them. And the foul mouth kids at school, we'll just keep our, our distance from them. If we're not careful, we will isolate, we will insulate ourselves from the people that God's going, hey, I love that crazy person and I want you to have play a role in me reaching him or her. But anyway, in our oikos, let's say that half of the people that we associate take on a weekly basis would be believers. And so those are those who are already believers. Okay, so the other half you would guess would be yeah, not yet believers. And uh, I, I, I don't call them non-believers. I don't call them non-Christians. And it's actually one of the many things that the catchy people, the Mayan group in Guatemala that we got to live with and love on and be a part of, there's something that they taught us. And uh, uh, with the catchy people, they're kind of short. And uh, in fact, they're really short. They're short people. I was always the tallest one in the room. It's kind of fun. You know, and uh, now in my work, I'm always the oldest one in the room. That wasn't as, that was not as much fun as being the tallest one in the room. But uh, I was always the tallest one in the room with the Guatemala, with the catchy people down in Guatemala with whom we work. But uh, for them, it wasn't impolite for you and me to have a conversation about a friend and the friend be standing there as a third party, but we would be talking about him or her. And so that wasn't rude for them, you know, uh, manners are socially defined. And uh, so, uh, I would be talking to a catchy brother and, and he'd be talking about his friend hey brother Robert I want you to know this is my friend John and I would say is John a Christian and he would say Mahi which means what do you guess yeah. not yet they never said Ink -ah. it was always Mahi so this would be the people in your life who are not yet believers and in fact, in BSM vernacular, we call them not yet Christians. Okay, among the not yet believers or the not yet Christians in your life, some of them, uh, frankly, uh, it may be quite a, quite a time. I'm talking about distance and time that uh, you know that we would be used by them and. Uh, it, that God would use us in their lives. But some of them, so those would be the not quite ready. Since we're in the business of making up new acronyms, okay? Not quite ready. But some of those, ready. In other words, God's been working on them. He's already probably sent the posse, uh, other people around them. I was at 
Texas A&M Commerce on Wednesday. And uh, we'd been out on campus all day long initiating conversation was total strange from nine to six. It was a great day. And one of the last guys we met at the end of the day, and frankly, I was having to really concentrate to pay attention because <laughs> uh, we'd talked to a lot of people by the end of the day. Well, this kid, kid named Tyler, uh, happened to be an ag major and happened to be a calf roper. He was on a rodeo team. And uh, so as we were talking, they all kind of came up and I said, hey, you and I have some stuff in common. And uh, as, as we talked, he said, you know what, this is really interesting. I always watch for those lines, how often I hear that. You know, when me and college student go out on campus, walk up a perfect stranger, initiate a conversation, we hope it begins up about God. You know, it's really interesting that you would say that because, and he started naming the people in his life who were believers who were talking to him, inviting him to go to church. And so he realized, he realized and admitted it right there with us, God's sovereignty determining time and place. That God had dispatched a committee and he was surrounded by believers. And in our conversation, he said, I think I ought to start paying attention. <laughs> and so I said, tell you what, I'm going to give you my phone number. And I did. And I said, what's yours? And I texted my name to him. And I said, uh, uh, I'd already, we'd kind of mentioned some of the things about the book of Romans. He said, I think I need to read that book. I said, okay, I'm your accountability partner. And uh, I'm the Romans reading guy. That's what I put on the text to him. And I said, when you read Romans, you text me back and tell you what you think. But you know what? I'm not the only one. I mean, I live... 300 miles away from him. But he has people surrounded him, surrounding him. In fact, there's an ag major's Bible study that they've been inviting him to. And then a guy in the BSN who is standing there beside me is leading a study of the book of Romans on Monday nights. He's surrounded. And so you see, what, what Paul said to do, to, to, for Timothy to do, you know, Paul's telling us to do too, to not ignore the people who we're sharing life with and get involved in their lives and be used by Him because the Great Commission doesn't depend on great preachers. It really depends on the amateurs. Okay. Let me tell you a couple of stories. <clears throat> uh, when I went away to college, I was one of those kids that represent the 70% of our church kids that go off to school as they chunk God. And it wasn't so much that I was mad at him or rebelling against him. Actually, I was in a much more dangerous position to, than that, and uh, I just didn't care. And when I went away to school on Sunday morning, it didn't, it didn't dawn on me to get up and go to church. And I'd grown up in a family. We went to church three times a week. But you know what? It just didn't take for me. I mean, I wanted to be... I wanted my parents to be proud of me, and I was a pretty good kid, and all that kind of stuff. But the God stuff just didn't take. And so when I went away to college, pretty much left God behind. And uh, uh, that's pretty much the way I was living. And then as you do that, you start to erode. And your morals start to erode too. And, you know, the company you keep starts affecting you. And, and actually, as it was, not on purpose, but I was getting further and further away from God. Well, there was another guy who also went to the same college that went Stephen F. Austin. And uh, uh, actually, we knew each other from before. And I had wanted to do something that I knew that he did well. And uh, I grew up on a, in East Texas, we'd call it a farm, we had livestock and stuff. And I grew up riding horses with my daddy. In fact, we had Shetland ponies when we were little bitty kids and stuff. And, and so I'd kind of grown up in that context. And, uh, but this guy was a real life rodeo cowboy. He rode calves. His name was Leland, Leland Swinney. And so uh, he's from the same hometown f that I was from, and he was going to the same college that I was going to. So, uh, taking initiative that I usually don't have, 
I, uh, I, I, you know, used to, we had those called phone books. You could look up people's names and they gave their address and everything. And, you know, now probably you'd get sued for all of that. But anyway, I looked up his name in phone book and I went and knocked on his door on Sneed Street in Tyler. And a man came to the door and I uh, said, hello, my name is Robert and uh, I'd like to learn to rope. And I wondered if, uh, if this is Leland's house. And his... It was Mr. Swinney, Marcus. He looked over his shoulder and said, Leland, Robert's here. And that day they welcomed me into their lives. And he said, come on in. And uh, so we made some, you know, got to know one another. And I said, I want to learn how to rope. He said, well, we got a roping dummy in the backyard. Let's, do it. let's, let's rope right now. So we went in the backyard and rope the dummy, told me how to build a loop. And, uh, uh, a loop is a rope kind of like that one right there. And so, anyway, that's where our friendship came from. But when it came time for me to go to college, Leland was a year ahead of me, and uh, uh, he'd already, you know, been to Stephen F. Austin, and I was going there, and uh, he said, why don't we buy a camping trailer? And we parked out Sam Kames Rope and pin out on the edge of town where we keep our calves and horses. And uh, we'll just live out there in a camping trailer and go to college, and we'll rodeo on weekends. And, and he, he, he mentored me. He really did. He taught me to rope. I never got as good as him. But uh, I got good enough not to lose all my money in, in rodeo. So that's the way we became roommates. That's the way we became friends. It was because of a rope. Well, uh, just a few weeks into the semester, you know, as a little old camping trader, it was little. It was about from here to that wall, was, it was big, but all we did was sleep there anyway. We didn't need room. Well, Leland had a practice every night before he went to bed. He'd sit at the little excuse of a table that they have in camping trailers. And he'd open his Bible and he'd read it. He wouldn't ever say anything. He'd just read, get kind of quiet. And I was in the other end of the trailer in my bunk looking at him. as double bunk, bunk bed kind of deal. And he'd close it and turn out the light and go to bed. And a few weeks into this practice, he said, you ever read the Bible? I said, no, not really. He said, you want to? I thought, Okay. I had no idea what I was in for. But every night, for the next months, we sat at that little table, and he'd open his Bible, and I found mine, the one that my church had given me when I became 12, you know, reached the age of accountability. And uh, I brought it back, and we read the Bible, and he knew to read in the book of Romans. And so we started reading through the book of Romans. And... You know, uh, Leland was real, the real guy. You know, we had these, our friendship was authentic, you know, because we liked the same stuff. But uh, more real to me in the trailer than Leland Swinney was the Spirit of God. And I was not prepared for that. And the God that I had been ignoring interrupted my life. And because of His sovereignty, he appointed Leland Swinney to play a part in my life. And uh, he arranged our times and our places so that we ended up in that camping trailer on Sam Kames' property, 60 feet from where our horses and cats were. Sovereign God. Hot pursuit. And I was the subject of the pursuit. I'm here with you today not because of a professional Christian, but because of an amateur, a college kid who roped calves and read his Bible and didn't ignore his roommate. That's why I'm here. <clears throat> okay, now let's fast forward. Uh, you know, there's a lot of story that happened, and then Kelly and I were honored to be uh, invited by the International Mission Board to move to Canada. And uh, Love Canada. We enjoyed living in Saskatchewan. It's only about 2,000 miles away from where you live, but I guess we would have been called neighbors, right? Right. <laughs> and uh, uh, so we, we, we moved up there, and, and uh, it was just within the months leading up to our time of leaving San Antonio, where I was the BSM director of SAC, and we were moving to Saskatchewan, that, that's when I read for the first time that Acts 17.26 that I didn't ignore, and it got my attention, and I thought, oh, God's in the business of de determining times and places. Well, I'm up for that, because we're about to move 2,000 miles, and it better be God that has something to do with it, otherwise we're going to make fools of ourselves. And so literally as we were driving, we loaded our stuff up in a cattle trailer. We really did. 
And we were driving 2,000 miles to move to Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada, it's north of Montana. I was thinking, God, you're the one in charge here. You're determining times and place. This is the time for us to go to that place. And it's based on this promise and this assumption because there are others who you've determined that place at this time and that we will be able to intersect their lives and be able to be used by you in your pursuit of them that they would come to know him. Now I realize that I know this kind of maturing uh, idea about ministry so I realized that that's really what I wanted my students to do at the University of Saskatchewan and BSM students there to be able to engage those around them who are not believers and be real intentional and spend their lives with them on purpose just like Leland done with me I thought you know what though if I'm only just going on campus and and my evangelism practice involves only reaching college students then I'm really asking them to do something that I'm not willing to do and that would be involved with my peers and my peers are married guys with kids. And so as we were moving, they were saying, God, help me become faithful to engage guys who are my peers so that my students will follow my example and engage their peers so we can have an impact on that campus. That was the prayer. Well, uh, we were there a few months. Wonderful place to be. Fall had already come. There was already a little bit of snow on the ground. And uh, my son and I uh, took a Sunday afternoon because in Saskatchewan, it's against the law to hunt on Sundays. And so but, uh, we went out and it was falling enough and close enough to the time that you, this matters. It, we had an old set of deer antlers and you can rattle deer antlers together and at the right time of the year the bucks hear that and they think it's two bucks fighting for a doe and so they come and then you get to like surprise them <laughs> and so Chris and I went out just with a video camera good night it was a Sunday afternoon so uh, uh, we went out and we were doing this and we did friends property uh, who we know and uh, one of the times we set up to do this we looked across the field and I mean here comes a guy like in a hurry and, uh, I mean, he's just coming right at us. And I'm thinking, what's up with this deal, you know? And sure enough, this guy comes walking right up to us. And he's one of these guys that just talks a whole lot. Hey, I heard y'all doing this. I've always seen, uh, wondered what that was. At first thought it was a bug fight. I was going to come over here and shoot a deer. But, uh, you know, it was on Sunday. You weren't supposed to anyway. But anyway, he said, then he realized it was us. But he just came up anyway. And I'm going like, we're wanting to video deer. We're not up here for you. You know, we didn't intend to rattle you up. And uh, anyway, I was trying to shut down the conversation as quickly as I could. I thought, business card. That gets rid of guys. So I got my business card out, and I gave it to that guy, and he gave me his, and I said, good, we're done, gone. <laughs> Next day, took our kids through their ice skating lesson, because in Canada, all kids skate, right? And our kids were from San Antonio, Texas. They hadn't done much ice skating. And so we didn't roll them on the class on Monday afternoons, and took them, and and I, I remember I was on my knees. Chris is sitting in on, on the chair there, and my son. And I was on my knees in front of him trying to get his skates on real good and tight. And you know how it is when you feel like somebody's looking at you? And I feel like somebody's looking at me. And so I looked over, and there was a guy who was over there doing the same thing as me. And when I looked over at him, he looked down. <laughs> and then I was looking at him trying to say, well, who's that guy? And he looked at me, and then I looked down. <laughs> And it dawned on both of us about the same time. You're that guy from yesterday. Times and places set by God. And guess what? For the next, I don't know how long, for th two or three or four months, Tim Shindrick and I had to sit there and wait on our kids to do their skating lessons. And we didn't have anything to do but talk about guns and hunting and reloading ammo. He was a taxidermist and fishing and we had all the stuff in common and we started to become friends but it wasn't lost on me you know I'm I'm sure I've missed maybe a thousand of these but I knew that day at the skating rink this is the times and places set by God this is Acts 17 26 I drove 2,000 miles pulling all of our stuff in a cattle trailer for Tim and those he represents. So we did. We became buddies. 
and uh, uh, our wives became friends. Interesting too that uh, it was almost the same week that they moved from Lethbridge, Alberta. You know where that is, south of Calgary. From Lethbridge, Alberta, and while we were driving 2,000 miles, they were driving 500 miles to land in Saskatoon. There was a park between our houses. We lived about two blocks south of that park. They, he and Diane lived about two blocks north of that park. Kelly and I would go to the park and jog, and Tim would too, because he smoked. And Diane didn't want him to smoke in the house. So we'd go to the park and smoke and jog. And so <laughs> we'd meet at the park. And so can you, can you see what's happening here? This is a sovereign God in hot pursuit of Tim Shindrick, and he he enlists a guy who likes to hunt and fish from San Antonio, Texas. He determines that they would both occupy the same place at the same time because God's in hot pursuit of Tim Shindra. And he was. Well, the pursuit could have been hotter for me because it actually took five years of this. Us becoming friends and doing stuff together as couples. We even went to see Jurassic Park together. And my wife is not into dinosaurs eating people movies. But we just started doing life with him and Diane. And then we were, actually, we helped start a church. And it was because of Tim and Diane that we wanted a church that we could bring them to and not have to explain a whole lot of what just happened to them when they came. That they would be able to hear about a loving God who's in hot pursuit and there not be a whole lot of baggage to sort through. Plant a church. And they did. Uh, Diane was a faster mover than Tim was. And uh, actually, it was a five-year process. And maybe just because I'm not very fast. Not very good. But uh, Tim is one of my 14 prayer partners. Tonight, I will email him. And we left Canada almost 20 years ago now. And uh, the Christian brother that we are to one another is one that has sustained being far, far away from one another for a long, long time. And so every Sunday night, he's among 14 guys that I say, this is what I've got going on in my life this week. Pray for me to be faithful with it, and I will for you too. And uh, that's Tim. Well, here's what I would like to ask. We already talked about where you go to school. You know, your families have crazy people in them and places where you work. There's a lot of drama. But what about the guys and the ladies with whom you just flat share an interest. You're interested in the same thing. The reason I was Leland's roommate is because we wrote calves. The reason Tim and I were friends, frankly, is because we like doing the same stuff, including fishing together, and we did that too. And that God would be so deliberate as to determine time and place for you and me, do you think he would pick somebody he thought couldn't do that? You can do this. It's because of that same promise he gave, you know, the 11 guys, I'll be with you. And I'm, I still, I'm full of insecurity. I know I kind of look pretty comfortable up here in front of you, but I assure you, by nature, I'm, I'm very reserved socially. And for me to be one that would do this sort of thing, that's transformation of a person's life story. That's what that is all about. But I relate so much to Moses. It's a verse that I don't have on the PowerPoint, but this is, he was feeling insecure because of a job that God had asked him to do. And it's in uh, uh, Exodus 3, verse 11, it says this, but Moses said to God, he had, you, you'll hear it, you'll get the context. Moses said to God, I'm nobody. Anybody relate to that? He said, I'm nobody. <laughs> How can I go to the king and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. And God answered, I'll be with you. <laughs> and when you bring the people out of Egypt, you'll worship me on this mountain. That will be the proof that I've sent, we, sent you. He'll be with us. He'll be with us. So, what's your rope? What's your fishing rod? Who's the person that God has already made a whole lot of trouble to put you in the same oikos with somebody who's not yet a believer because he is in hot pursuit? I would have never become a believer because the BSM 
at Stephen F. Austin was doing a great job, I'd have never found the place. It was only a calf roper and a camping trailer. They would have ever been used if I got to reach me. And that's what God sent. Where's your rope? Let's pray together, okay. Lord, it is incredible to us, as big as you are, as powerful as you are, and how much stuff you have going on, that you cared enough about me that uh, I couldn't hide from you in a camping trailer, but exactly the place that you put me. And then, Lord, that you cared enough about Tim that you went to a lot of trouble to move his family and ours and the expense involved in that and you made us friends because of common interests you gave us and you I got to see you work in his life to totally transform him in your image thank you that he's a guy that I'll email tonight and he's one of my prayer partners the Lord I know that I'm not special and I know that Leland wasn't special and uh, I know that everybody in this room Everybody in this room can be used by you to reach those crazy people in their lives who will not wake up on a Sunday morning and come to church. And I pray that we'll be faithful with that call. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to finish up. Your church, I understand, is uh, in the habit of ending with an invitation. We're going to do so. Two of the deacon men will be here. And uh, if you'd like to talk to somebody, maybe you're going, hey, I'm the Tim. God's been in hot pursuit of me, and I realize it now, and I'm just going to just tell everybody in front of them today, I'm going to cooperate with God. Whatever He has going on in my life is what I'm going to be up to. You may be the one who says, man, I've got this guy, and if I sure wish God would pick somebody else a whole lot better at it than me. But, uh, okay, God, help me know how to do that, to have an inf influence in my person's life the people. Let me do that. If any of those is something you'd like to share with somebody else and be accountable to them, then we're here. Two, two of the deacons are here. If you'd like to talk to me too, you can do so. Let me pray, and we're going to sing, and then you respond. Lord, I do. I do thank you for the way that you work in our lives and that you even sit in a church pew this morning would reach out and touch us in a way that we know we're not supposed to ignore you. Pray you'll give us the courage to respond today in Jesus' name. Amen.